The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out Sunday afternoon as if anyone had anything better to do than me sitting here on Sunday afternoon, but I thank you all for coming out. Uh, this is about Zen Project 4.4 features and futures. Um, so some of this stuff, you know, I don't know. How many people are currently using Zen Project software? How many people are thinking about it or exploring? Okay. So I will warn, some, a few of these points are like really gnarly sorts of things that if you're really into it, makes sense. Otherwise, we'll just kind of gloss over them pretty quickly. Um, and uh, I will try to keep the, blame, the brain bleed to a minimum uh, for some of those things. Uh, generally, uh, this release, 4.4.0, uh, was back in March. and. Uh, the interesting thing is that you know we had been working on a nine-month uh, cycle. Uh, this release, they tried to knock it down to six months. They thought it would be a better result, and we actually came fairly close uh, overall. And uh, we think the results are actually uh, rather good. Uh, let me just do a little foundation work before we start. Too, as I started to mention to some of the people here, Zen Project is open source. Uh, as of April of last year, we became a Linux Foundation collaborative project. Um, so, because some, sometimes there's this confusion about, well, is Zen commercial? Well, no, there's a number of commercial offerings from various companies, including Citrix, who pays my freight, uh, that use Zen project under the covers. Uh, most uh, common of which is Zen Server, which had been sort of a commercial add on. Uh, it was sort of a distribution of Zen project with, uh, with some extra GUI support and other you know, nice stuff tied with a nice red bow and a book and all that sort of good stuff. And Zen Server actually got open sourced last summer by Citrix. But they are separate from us, we are separate from them. Uh, we give the foundation that they build on. But there's a number of things out there that use Zen project as, as a core. If you have ever used Amazon uh, web services, you're a Zen user. Uh, if you've tried the new Verizon cloud that was advertised end of last year, you're a Zen user. There are uh, Linode out there, Zen. Uh, there are lots and lots of hosting providers that use Zen because we scale well. We work. And uh, there's a number of other things having to do with security, which are beyond the scope of this talk, which I can discuss with anyone afterwards if they feel like it, um, as to why people who really care tend to pick Zen when it comes to some la large externally facing cloud or hosting situation. Uh, let's just do a very quick two minute run through of just understanding what Zen is and why it's a little different than some others. Uh, this is a textbook picture of a type one hypervisor. And a type one hypervisor, as you can see, the hypervisor layer sits directly on the host hardware. There is no host operating system. It just runs right on the metal. And on top of the hypervisor layer, then you have all the VMs that you use. That is just a textbook picture. This is a textbook picture of a type two hypervisor, also known as a hosted hypervisor. And we see that the hypervisor layer actually resides within some form of host operating system. And uh, we see that therefore the data flow is a little different than it is from a type one. It's not quite as direct. Um, and so it's, uh, it's just a, a little different. Which is better? Well, in truth, whichever one works best for you. That's kind of the bottom line. There are two different approaches to the same basic problem. Now, Zen tends to resemble more of type one, and most people, I think, would argue that KVM looks a little bit closer to, to type two, although I've heard certain KVM people insist that it is type one, despite the fact it has a host OS. So, you know, that's up to them to try to explain, but I'm not even going to try. 
Um, so here, once again, this is the textbook version of type one, and Zen is sort of type one with a twist. This is what the Zen project architecture looks like. Now you notice it looks very, very similar. Everything is laid out pretty much the same, except we see something that's different. You notice that the device drivers and device models are not present in the hypervisor layer. Instead, we put them inside, at least by default, in something we call the control domain. And the control domain is a Linux or, at this point, a NetBSD uh, instance that provides those, uh, those drivers to the hypervisor. Now, why would we do this? Uh, anyone with a little bit of gray in their temples who's been working with Linux for a while may remember the good old days, particularly in the late 90s, when you would go out to maybe your local computer show or whatever, and you come back with that new snazzy piece of hardware that you had been waiting for, you'd anxiously put it in the box, and you turn it on, and up, oh, no driver. So you either had to look at upgrading the operating system, or you had to go out to FreshMeet or SourceForge, or you had to try to download a driver from somewhere and see if it would fit, see if it would work. It was not a pretty situation. Well, it kind of makes sense that we don't want to go through that again at the hypervisor layer. You don't want to be patching your hypervisor every time you bring in a new box. Um, so instead, why not leverage the fact that Linux and the BSDs have already done a pretty bang up job of device driver development? And so that's part of the reason why we use the control domain, which gives us the opportunity to leverage that so the hypervisor layer itself doesn't have to be disturbed. Um, it actually works out very, very well architecturally. Um, and as we'll see in a, a few more slides, it also gives us the ability to do some other interesting things for both performance and security reasons, uh, notably disaggregation, which I'll describe in a moment. Now, here's a, uh, here's a basic map of, of what we see here. We have the host hardware on the bottom, we've got the hypervisor layer, we have the control domain, and we've got the guest VMs. Now the guest VMs, of course, are the things you're really interested in. Those are your applications that you're seeking to, uh, uh, seeking to virtualize. Now, what's the other function of the control domain? That's also to give, basically, console control. Because one of the things that's missing from the generalized architecture is how do you talk to the hypervisor? You sure don't want your guest VMs talking to the hypervisor. Most of them should be blissfully ignorant of the fact that it exists at all, ideally. Um, so that is the second uh, task of the control domain, is to actually speak to the hypervisor. So it basically has those two tasks. <coughs> it is the interface to the outside world, and it's the interface to the hardware. Now, we do have one other piece, an optional piece, called driver domains or stub domains. And if anyone was in the security talk, I talked about this uh, a bit there. But the concept is that let's say that you've got your drivers sitting inside that control domain. And for performance reasons, maybe you don't want it all going through one copy of the driver. Maybe, maybe you want multiple copies of the driver. Or for security reasons, you don't want there to be any possible entrance into the privileged control domain. You just want to keep something in the box. So if it gets violated from a security standpoint, they've got nothing. They've got a fishbowl you know, that doesn't have capabilities. So we have this concept called disaggregation. And we can actually pull drivers and device models out of the uh, control domain where they reside standardly and give them their own little VMs to, to reside in. And using our security uh, uh, extensions called Flask, which is sort of SE Linux at the VM level, we can actually tie this thing down tight. So it, you know, if it's a network driver, basically can only talk to the network. It can't look at the password file. It can't talk to the database. It can't talk to your disk drive. Nothing. Because why would you need to do that? All it's supposed to do is talk on the network. So I mean, we can tie this down from a security standpoint. And at the same time, we can also replicate those things. So for a performance standpoint, we can increase throughput. 
So this is all part of the basic design of Zen Project. So let's talk for a few minutes about some of the 4.4 features. Now this one, this is a little bit of a nitty gritty, but I'll explain the goodness of it in a moment. We have a thing called event channels. And prior to this release, they were limited to uh, 1024 or 496. And basically every time the uh, control domain or domain zero has to talk to something, it needs an event channel to do it. And for years this was fine because this gave us a practical limit of about three to five hundred VMs on a box. And three to five hundred VMs on a standard server was more than enough. But something has happened in the last couple of years. Um, if you go to zenproject.org, you will see things like Mirage OS. Uh, if you attend some of the other sessions, I don't think it was at this one, but some of the other shows I've been to recently, talk about OSV and uh, Ling, which is Erlang on Zen. And there's a number of these things, which are these cloud operating systems. Rather than being a giant full Linux stack or Windows stack, they are very, very small dedicated operating systems. And basically all that they do is to act as a base for an application server. So if you just want a Java instance, say, that's going to be you know, serving up pages through the web server or doing some basic application, you don't need to have an entire operating system. You need a small piece of an operating system that's just enough to give Java life and do the things you want to do. Well, as a result, if you use one of these solutions, three to 500 VMs per host may be a drop in the bucket. You might want to do 1,000 per host or more um, because these things are very small, very light, very nimble. And as such, the event channel limits suddenly became a problem where they were never a problem before. So work was done, and now the you know, 1 to 5,000 limit is now up to over 100,000. And so practically speaking, we've got you know, VMs coming out the yin-yang potentially. Uh, uh, this, is, this should hold us for years. And uh, suddenly all these things like Mirage, uh, Erlang on Zen, OSV, HAL VM, these are all these cloud operating systems now can be enabled so you have to have a mass scale of VMs. If that's what's on your, on your plate to do, there is now nothing keeping you back from it. Plus, it included uh, sort of improvements in the fairness algorithm. So, um, so you, as you can imagine, the uh, setting priorities on a thousand different machines competing uh, can be tricky. And they've actually done some nice stuff there. So uh, you'll get better service out of it on top of it. Uh, a second thing, and this is probably the kind of the headliner for this particular release, is PVH. Now, uh, I'm going to talk just in just a second about the different virtualization modes in Zen. Um, but Zen pioneered what's known as para-virtualization. Uh, when you see a lot of uh, virtualiz virtualization technologies, they do full virtualization or hardware virtualization. So when you load your guest VM on, on the hypervisor, it looks like it's talking to hardware. You know, you ask it, well, what's your network card? And it'll tell you a brand of a network card that you can probably go find on a shelf somewhere and, uh, and various things. So these operating systems think they're talking to hardware. And that's necessary if you're working with like Windows because Windows doesn't know about anything at the hypervisor layer, it just knows about hardware. Zen brought in the, non, the concept of para-virtualization, which is, you know, this hardware virtualization is good, but if you have to take data and you have to pack it down so that it fits into a packet that some piece of hardware could use, that takes time. That's kind of expensive. And it's even more expensive because that hardware doesn't exist. So you're, it's going to create this packet, throw it down to this fake piece of hardware, and then on the other end you have to unpack it and do something useful with it because that's not really the way the hardware is set up. 
So rather than do that, why don't we just open up kind of a really simple, slick, fast pipe? And we'll just sort of like toss things down the pipe. We don't have to pack it very much. And on the other end, it can be just immediately sort of opened up and you know, sent on its way. So that's the concept of power virtualization. It's a powerful concept, but you need the cooperation of the guest VM, the guest operating system. The guest operating system has to know that that's what's going on because there isn't any real piece of hardware there. So, uh, so we have those two extremes. We have the PV or power virtualized, and we have the HVM or the hardware virtualized. Well, the problem is that the, the uh, power virtualized works fast in some areas, and hardware virtualized does a little better in other areas. Well, what do we do? As I, as I said, this is sort of explaining that. Zen came up with two other modes. Uh, the first one was called PVHVM. And if you're not used to these terms, this can cause brain bleed. So believe me, I'm going to go lightly through this, and there will be no quiz, so don't let it get to you. No aneurysms, please. Um, PVHVM came along with the notion of, you know what? If we're doing this hardware virtualization, so you know, you're packing things up to go on your virtual NE2000 or whatever network card, it would be faster if we could instead create a driver that lived inside that guest that's actually just a, looks like a really, really simple piece of hardware. And on the back end, it just feeds directly down into the power virtualized pipe. So basically, the Windows operating system, mostly, doesn't have to know, it just has to know it has a new piece of hardware that's really, really easy to use. And as a result, the speed comes up some because it's not virtualizing some complex piece of hardware. And so that was the first thing that we had was PVHVM. And that's pretty good. Uh, it's a, it does do a, a, an excellent improvement performance-wise over HVM. But now there's also this one called PVH. <coughs> and as we'll see in just, just another slide, PVH works from the other side, from the power virtualized side, saying, why don't we come up with the absolute optimal performance situation so that we get the absolute best throughput. That's what PVH does. Here, now let's take a look at this eye chart for a second. And, you know, you look at this and your, your eyes start to cross if you look at it too long. Uh, and it looks very confusing. But you see the various modes there and you see various things which are virtualized in what mode. Don't stare at it too long, You'll, your brain will hurt. Let me color it though and it starts to be a little bit more interesting. We see the red area is something that really doesn't perform very well. Orange, orange gold area are things that are okay, but they really could be improved, and then the green areas are good. So we see that when we start with full virtualization on the top, we had one red area, two gold area, and one green. So performance wasn't very good. It worked, but it wasn't very good. Fully power virtualized on the bottom, you had three of the four had good performance and one that could do better. PVHVM, as I said, is the third one down here. We notice now we've got, once again, three green blocks, one yellow block, so that's improvement. But PVH, the new one, green across the board. So it's meant to be the optimal hypervisor mode. And Right now, it was released in 4.4. <coughs> the speed, it's working well in some areas and not in others. Uh, the uh, Rakesh, who's uh, doing a lot of the work on this, is, uh, believes that by the time 4.5 comes out at the end of the year, um, he should pretty much have it up to speed. That's his goal. So right now, you can experiment with it, but in terms of production, you know, probably next release we should see something that's production worthy. And with that, we should see the best uh, virtualization scenarios that we've ever seen out of the software. So that's, a, that's big news for us. Uh, PVH is one of those things that's been sort of in the works for a couple of years and wanted for even longer. So we think this is going to be uh, something that's going to be immensely powerful in, in the years to come. 
Disk driver domains, uh, this is one that's a little bit on the technical side, but it used UDEV under the covers uh, under Linux. As a result, um, you ended up with different features, depending on whether you're running a Linux guest or a non-Linux guest. The new solution just creates parity across the board. So we don't have to worry about whether it's Linux or non-Linux. It works, it works well, it works the same. Uh, that's kind of the, the bottom line. Plus, it allows us to add things that we never had, like QDisk uh, support and things like this. Now, it can easily be added in from the bottom, and we don't need to worry about it. So that's, that's one of those things that's going to uh, only improve over time as it gets used more and more. Uh, how many people use KVM somewhere? Uh, you ever use Spice? The simulator? Well, it's the... the protocol for reaching into a VM and actually looking at the desktop. Yeah. Um, some people do, and uh, we actually had some people inside our community who said, you know, we use KVM and we use Zen. Uh, we'd, like, uh, we'd like to just use Spice across the board, because we use Spice on the KVM side. Well, fine. So they ended up adding Spice support to Zen. So if that's a direction for your installation, if you're using uh, you know, both types of hypervisors and you like Spice, we now do Spice. Um, it's a uh, replacement for things like VNC. Um, and it works pretty well from what I've heard. Not a whole lot of people are using it. Um, Grub, uh, if you were at the security talk, we talked a bit about some of the, sh some of the shortcomings having to do with, uh, with Grub. Uh, we have a thing called PyGrub and another thing called PVGrub. Um, and PV Grub is the better of the two. It's the more secure of the two. And now, in the actual Grub bootloader, PV Grub is actually being built through their project as of, I think, this last release. I think it's out now. I'm not sure. We have to check the, the Grub release cycle. But basically, now that's all fully integrated there. So, um, so we really don't have to worry about com compatibility because it's actually part of their project. This is one of the things, as I was describing to some people uh, before we began. For years, the past few years, Zen Project has not done the greatest in the world integrating with other projects in the community. This is one of the examples of us doing it. Likewise, integrating into the kernel properly. We, just to be clear, the hypervisor doesn't reside in the kernel, but there are certain things that are needed in the kernel to be able to talk to the hypervisor. <coughs> and now the days of having to load a Zen kernel to boot up the hypervisor are pretty much done in, in most operating systems. The, the really the sole uh, difference there in the Linux world is CentOS. And that's because Red Hat made a business decision to basically disable Zen. And so the Zen for CentOS effort came along um, which I've spoken about in other places too, uh, to actually restore that. So part of that effort is to put a, a standard Linux LTS kernel.org kernel in place that has all the Zen bits where they belong. And if anyone's interested in that, I can talk about that to you afterwards. But we are trying to play well with others is kind of bottom line here, and it's paying off. Uh, we have some indirect descriptors for the block PV protocol. Basically, you know, we're living in the era of big data. And, you know, moving single blocks at a time was fine for a long time. Uh, it's not anymore. Now we have volumes of data and we m must have high performance uh, as well. And so now in our power virtualization, we now have much better performance when it comes to the I.O. Uh, particularly when you're doing things like solid state disks and what have you, uh, where it's really, really important to be able to get things moving fast. And once again, uh, it says available in any guest running uh, Linux 3.11 or higher. So this was one of these times as well where we worked with the kernel people because most of this capability is in what we call PVOps, which is the portion of the kernel that does power virtualization support. <coughs> K-exec, uh, this is something that's also at the kernel level, and this is more of a developer thing, uh, but 
it gives us this interesting capability that if for some reason we're testing a new, new version of the hypervisor and it hoses, it, we actually have the uh, possibility of not having to just reboot, but actually do a start of a different image inside that space so that we can then debug. Uh, if you're a developer, this is like major woo-woos. For the rest of us mere mortals, it's like, huh, but you know, whatever. But it is actually very interesting functionality, and it means that in the long term, we should have a much better uh, project because our ability to debug has just improved. Uh, Zappy and Mirage OS, I mentioned Mirage OS before. Mirage OS is one of these lightweight cloud operating systems. It is one that is under the auspices of Zen Project. If you go to zenproject.org, which is kind of the center of our universe, uh, you can find all sorts of interesting stuff about Mirage OS. Mirage is, has gone into a full 1.0 release as of just a few months ago. So, I mean, it is actually ready to rock and roll. Um, I think they're actually, I, I'm hearing that uh, probably around August or so, we may even see a 2.0 release come out of Mirage. So, I mean, there's a lot of good work going there. We now have better support for that. Uh, the other thing that's of note is what is known as the Zappy layer. Um, Zappy is one of the Zen toolkits. One, it's the Zen API. And uh, it is the one that gives cloud-like functionality. Um, I should say that for people who don't know the Zen toolkit story, we actually have three different toolkits that you can use to talk to the hypervisor. You say, well, that's really confusing. Well, not really. They have three different targets. And different organizations use whichever toolkit makes the most sense for them. Um, the native one is called Zen Lite or Excel, and that just is basically I am talking to the hypervisor on one machine, I want it to do stuff, plain and simple. Second one is Libvirt. How many people know what Libvirt is? Libvirt, if you work with KVM particularly, you know Libvirt because that's the interface frequently that KVM uses. Well, we're trying to make it possible so once again, if you have a mixed environment, we want to be able to build up libvirt so that you can issue a libvirt command and it will work for KVM and it will work for Zen. So if that's your environment, you can do libvirt. The third one is Zappy, the Zen API. Zen API is a richer, um, <coughs> richer environment that looks across hypervisors. So it includes things like migration from one uh, one piece of hardware to another. That's done at the Zappy level. If that's something you want to do, then you want to work with Zappy. If you're doing cloud orchestration, you know, you're doing like CloudStack or one of these other things, they may already have that capability, or OpenStack, they may already have the capability inside one of their own pieces of software, so you may not need to use it at that level. So those pieces of software may work at the Excel level instead. It's all up to them, quite honestly, whichever one fits best. I would say this, too, just as sort of a, a uh, sidelight here. For people who are dealing with VMware, I get questions sometimes about, you know, what's the, what's the big difference between a Zen Project and VMware? Well, you can talk about the architecture, but the, I think one of the biggest things, one of the things that seems to resonate best, is that frequently commercial hypervisors like VMware they sell you on the hypervisor, and then they begin to tell you how your cloud's going to look. They want you to do things their way. Zen Project works the exact opposite. We're not here to dictate to you anything about the way your operation should work. Instead, if you have a need, we want to fill the need. That's why we have things like three toolkits because there are different needs depending on your organization and we want to be there. So there is a huge difference in concept between like the VMwares and Hyper-Vs of the world versus things like Zen Project because we're not about to dictate to you what your life should look like. And right now, I mean, I've spent a lot of time working with clouds. I worked with a startup that was dealing with clouds before the term cloud was even uh, coined and 
it is so early to get yourself tied into one concept of what the cloud is. Because if you look at clouds today compared to, say, three years ago, there's some huge differences. And so three years from now, you can probably bet solid money it's going to look even more different than it does today. So rather than tying your, your horse, you know, tying your cart to one horse, it makes sense to us that you just keep going and you go with the technology that makes most sense for you where you are, when you are. <coughs> so that's a difference. Now, Zappy is also, I think I said, is used by the Zen server folks. And if you're working with Zen server, uh, that'll be a benefit there. And some of the plans I've seen uh, regarding the future of Zen server, they're going to be leveraging it even more. So I mean, that's good news. And uh, there were binding overhauls. Uh, Zappy tends to be written in, in what's known as OCaml, uh, as is Mirage which is a strange little language, but, uh, but it gets the job done. We also have a, a, a tech preview of nested virtualization. Somewhat limited at the moment and not quite ready for production, but it works. So if you want to run KVM on Zen or Zen on Zen, you can. Uh, this has never really been an option before. And you might think this is a really weird ass thing to be doing, but if you think about the world of clouds and cloud integrators who, in, who, are, in, who are in part our user base, they gotta run tests. And you don't wanna be having huge farms of all sorts of hypervisors hanging out all over the place to run your tests. It'd be really nice if you could have you know, a couple of test pieces of hardware and you can, you can simulate yourself a nice you know, pool of various hypervisors and things to run software tests against. So this is actually kind of a neat concept, um, and it is well supported. You know, we even have you know Windows 7 XP compatibility mode and stuff like this set up. And setting this up is not difficult. By the way, these slides are uh, online at zenproject.org. So if you see things here and you look at the hyperlinks, you don't need to like scratch them down. Just go to the slide set online. And click away and have fun. So, has anyone played around with how many levels deep of virtualization can you go? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, the question is, how, has anyone played with the number of levels of virtualization? Uh, honestly, I don't know, because it is a tech preview. It's, you know, it's kind of a lab trick at the moment, but it has, it has legs, so I mean, we expect that in a release or two, it will be to the point where we will consider it, you know, fully, uh, fully operational and ready for, for use. I, I can't imagine going more than two, though. So somebody's got to try it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the comment was, can't imagine going more than two. And that's true for, for the most part. But then again, there are stranger things in the world. Um, I, as uh, someone once described uh, installing in a full Oracle database in our control domain. Is it possible? Sure. Why? Don't have a clue. <laughs> you know, I mean, it certainly ain't best, best practices, but you can do it. So, I mean, the fact that you can do it means that someone will. Uh, I don't know why, but, you know, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, although it's interesting, and as we're going to find out in just a minute, the question of people being able to do things that they want to do as opposed to what they're told to do uh, is bringing about some really interesting future bits in Zen. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, the whole secure boot thing um, with uh, the EFI booting standard. And uh, we now have experimental support for that. So if that's the way you really want to go, for whatever reason that might be, uh, we will uh, more or less support it right now. It's still experimental, which means that probably with 4.5, it'll probably be declared stable and ready, ready to go. Uh, EFI is a little odd in that even though it is supposedly one spec, various vendors sort of implement it slightly differently. It, it's, not it's not really standardized. Yeah, I, I mean, there are certain papers that claim to be or whatever, but it's like, yeah, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it's, uh, uh, there are many flavors, so it may take a while for things to get sort of ironed out, but uh, it is more or less operational uh, in its current instanti instantiation. And if you find bugs, obviously file them uh, so that we can improve it. 
Uh, Gluster FS, this really isn't an even an engineering thing, but we found that we didn't have any documented usage of how to use Gluster FS with Zen. And so some of the Gluster team worked with some of our team and sort of spec'd it out. So if, if that's something that's on your radar, uh, you can click on that and it'll give you basically a how-to. It's not particularly difficult. And it's using really all the integration stuff that Zen already has. But it gives you a starting place. So I mean, if that's something your organization wants to do, uh, it's very, very possible and you can find the information there. <coughs> Another big area both currently and in future is ARM support. How many people are looking at ARM servers maybe as a future state? Anyone? Yeah, some of it. It's one of those kind of interesting things that, you know, you, I mention it to people and they say, well, why would you want to do that? But it comes along, I think, with the, the concept of these cloud operating systems. The notion that rather than having, you know, really big, heavy, uh, power-consuming servers who throw off a lot of heat and therefore need a lot of cooling to do, like, uh, edge of web type things, that it makes a lot more sense maybe for certain payloads to have lots and lots of little bitty things that just work really quickly and do one thing really, really well, but do it at very low power, low cooling, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where ARM comes in. And, um, and that's why you see Mirage and OSV and some of these other ones really starting to gain traction. But our ARM story is really a powerful story at this point. Uh, we do have much better ARM support, and you can see the various, you know, board options here. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's been quite a bit of work in this area, quite a bit of emphasis in this area, and we're very uh, active in things like Lenaro, you know, and, and the work that's going on there for the future of ARM. Um, uh, there are some of the boards, if you're interested in which boards, et cetera. Et cetera but, uh, uh, I, well, I don't have, hang on for one sec, yep. I don't have the slide in here and I apologize. I was hoping I was going to see the architecture slide. Uh, you were saying? Um, on the previous slide I saw Calzetta. Yes. I, I know that Calzetta had gone out of business. Right. Uh, the interesting thing, you know, we still reference it because it still works. Um, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, Calzetta uh, has kind of disappeared from the map, but now you have Cavium. Uh, that has appeared, which actually just joined uh, uh, the Zen Advisory Board and in, interestingly enough has some of the same people that used to be at Calzada. Uh, and Cavium is doing, I, I think, you know, is doing some of the things that Calzada wanted to do, uh, only a bit differently maybe, but, uh, but a lot of interesting arm work coming out of there. So I mean as a reference platform, if you have the Calzada midway, it works. Uh, but that's not our target, obviously, because Calzada, you know, is no more. Um, but, uh, but the big thing is that we want to be there for the ARM support. And uh, I don't have the architecture slide in here, and I apologize. But our ARM story for the hypervisor is incredibly strong. Um, the, uh, if you look at the uh, architecture of ARM, with the hypervisor extensions, which came along in ARM v7, I believe it is, there is a hypervisor layer, and Zen fits exactly in the hypervisor layer, period, end of discussion. There is no changing mode to the, to the higher kernel layer, which means there is no need to escalate privilege, there is no need to, uh, to reduce performance by having to go through, uh, you know, mode changes. It fits. It fits like hand in glove. So performance-wise, on ARM, I think we have the best story in the industry, period, end of discussion. Um, it is extremely strong. I was talking with uh, Stefano Stabilini, who's uh, one of the guys who, who focuses on Zen on ARM, and he said it was, like, it was like they implemented from the same spec as we did. It just fits, it just absolutely fits. So that's one of the things that is just really, really cool in terms of uh, what's coming down the road. Zen on ARM, we think, is going to be a really massively important and interesting story. Uh, early microcode loading, I'm not going to spend any time on this because if you know what that means, you're excited. If you don't know what it means, you don't care. But 
you know, so if, if you're a geek and you're worried about when your microcode's coming into play, chances are you're happy. Now, let's talk about things that are a little bit more interesting. Futures. As I alluded to before, the notion that people will do with Zen Project what they want to is bringing on some interesting, uh, interesting concepts for the future. One is Zen Automotive, which I think was just approved as a subproject, or at least is going through the, the process of being approved as a subproject. Uh, Zen Automotive is the concept that your car needs a hypervisor to do multimedia entertainment. And, you know, when I first heard about that, and when a lot of us first heard about that, we were thinking, you know, somebody's been hanging around by the exhaust pipe too long or something, you know, a little, little oxygen deprivation here. But when you think about it, historically, when you think of computers in cars, you tend to have n number of discrete processors, usually different, doing various dedicated tasks. Each has to be sourced, each has to be programmed, each has to be debugged. They have to be somehow more or less wired together. It's a mess. And someone said, you know, with all the onboard information and entertainment systems in a car these days, it would make sense to have one suitable processor. But you've got these varying different use cases, so it makes sense to put a hypervisor on that processor and have different VMs running different parts of the infotainment system. The thing that does the, you know, the automatic call button from the dash. The thing that does the DVDs to the separate headrests in the back for the kids. Uh, you know, the thing that does the programmable radio. And all these various use cases, all discreetly done as VMs. Really kind of an intriguing concept. And once again, we're seeing that, once again, in the ARM area particularly. Low power, dedicated task, fits really well into the ARM architecture. Zen GT, something that uh, we're seeing Intel working with particularly, virtualized GPU support. Uh, you know, historically, we think of hypervisor, we think of servers. We're virtualizing servers. More and more, though, we're seeing the case where we want hypervised or virtualized desktops. And maybe they're virtualized desktops running games, high volume video activity. Well, Zen GT is focused on that sort of concept. The notion that you can have uh, you know, various VMs that are doing full video, full streaming video simultaneously and you want to be able to flip over from one to the other and immediately go from the movie to the game to whatever else, to the map system, whatever it is, and just have it go bam, 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 not waiting for all sorts of you know, wild repaints. Really intriguing concept and a lot of work that's gone in there and it's very, very interesting. <coughs> Even more ARM stuff coming. One of the interesting things that came out of the Developer Summit last year was the notion of putting Zen on one of these. Now, why would you put Zen on a phone? Well, it turns out if you're someone like me and you have your phone and you use it for your work email and you work for a suitably large company, frequently they reserve the right to say, when you leave, we're going to issue the wipe command and the picture of the wife, the dog, the kids, gone contacts. That's nasty. And someone said, well, what happened if you would have different personalities on your phone? So you have your business phone in a VM. You have your personal phone in the VM. Maybe other things. So that you get the wipe command and, okay, your business VM goes away. All those business contacts, all your papers, all the, you know, all the critical emails, all gone. But the other personality, with the wife, the dog, the kids, etc., intact. Why does that need to go anywhere? It's an interesting concept. Not one that anyone on the platform team, for sure, had ever dreamed of. But someone thought, hey, this is perfect fit, and it really does work well. Once again, ARM-based thinking, largely, 
one of these things that's going to be really, really interesting. Another big one's going to be PVH, as I said. The goal is this is going to be the release where the performance is going to be where it needs to be. That's the goal. So by the end of the year, if you come to User Summit, particularly in September, uh, hopefully we will have a progress report that says it's, uh, it's about cooked. Um, another interesting one that's come along from the, uh, largely from the Verizon folks is VMDK support format. If you're working with VMware, I'm sorry, if you're working with VMware, uh, <laughs> we can, uh, th you know, they want it so that we can, we can actually take one of their VMDK files, throw it into the system, boot it up and go. It's very interesting. That's, uh, that's going to be uh, something to watch, and that's coming along really well. We're trying to play well with others, which also means integration more with things like CloudStack and OpenStack and so forth. Uh, Zen for CentOS, as I mentioned earlier, um, was kind of a really interesting effort. I do a separate talk on that, but uh, trying to bring back to CentOS the Zen capabilities. Lots of people very, very interested in that. Uh, much more than I would have guessed. But as it turns out, you know, when, when Red Hat made a decision to go with KVM, it apparently didn't have a lot of large hosting companies that were Red Hat Zen. CentOS, on the other hand, had a lot of them. Because the hosting companies, they didn't need to pay for the Red Hat license for umpteen thousand, you know, uh, machines. So CentOS was fine for them. And now, you know, you have a choice. You want to upgrade. Well, either you have to change your distribution or change your hypervisor. Well, if you've, if you've done any operation sorts of stuff at all, you know you probably cook software that works for both of those areas. So in other words, you're going through retooling. If you've got to throw one of them away, you, this, is not a, this is not a simple task. This is not, you know, plug and replace. So along comes the Zen for CentOS effort, which was started by people in the CentOS area saying, give us an option. And they came to the Zen project folks and saying, you know, what can we do? And we came up with something that's really, really simple and very basic to install. It really, it's one of these things that, you know, I, I've got a slide that explains it. And I, and I said when I was doing this, and I've given this talk to a couple CentOS dojos, I said when I, when I was preparing the talk, it's like, well, I could do a demo. And then I realized that the demo is more boring than the slide is. Because you really issue three commands and bam, you know, you're ready. Three commands reboot. Ugh, you know, where's the demo in that? It, it's, it's, it's actually exceptionally simple. Out of that as well has come an effort in the CentOS area of what's known as virtualization SIG. Um, you can find that announcement online as well. And uh, the Zen project is very happy to be taking a lead in this. But CentOS as a project is now trying to come up with its own platform for virtualization. And it doesn't matter whether it's Zen or KVM or OpenBZ or Docker, whatever you want to do. And so they're, uh, they're asking players to come in and play. And we're already in there and we're playing. But they want to be able to produce something that is for the cloud people, for the hosting people, that will be just the primo virtualization platform variant of CentOS. Uh, we are working more and more to try to get the libvirt support in. We've had much greater interest in the past six to nine months. A lot has come along, which is really neat. We've got the automated testing system, which is still coming along. <coughs> Within Citrix, we've had something like this. But there are lots and lots of people outside that want to test stuff. and. Uh, so now we are putting together something that will be externally facing. So if you're a developer and you're working with Zen, uh, you, you'll have access to, the, to a fully functional test bed. That's still in development. It's going to be a little while before it gets out, but, but that is, is coming along. We're doing a lot of performance enhancements. Uh, we've got some upcoming meetings uh, that I'll mention. We have Developer Summit. If you're going to LinuxCon North America in Chicago, Developer Summit's there for two days. Uh, the one that is near and dear to my heart is User Summit, uh, which I'm organizing. So if you have any questions about User Summit, see me, please. Uh, it's in New York City, September 15th, which is a Monday, which means if you want to do like the long weekend thing and, you know, 
do the tourist thing on the weekend and spend a day geeking out about Zen on Monday, you know, please, please. It's all of $79. You know, it's probably the best training value you're going to get uh, out, of, out of Zen, and we've got some really good speakers. We're about to announce the lineup probably in about a week or so. And uh, you can see all that stuff at the zenproject.org site. Questions, comments, spitballs, rants. Thank you, Russ. <laughs> You're welcome. Once again, thank you all for coming on a Sunday afternoon as if you had nothing better to do. I'm just glad it's not football season. Um, thank you. Oh, for anyone who wants to see it, who has three minutes, let me just throw something up here. This is a, a thing that I've been working on, I mentioned it earlier, is one of the complaints we've had with people is once you get into Zen, it, you know, people work with Zen and do stuff. We want to start presenting an on-ramp if we can, and this is just a work in progress, and I mean it really is a work in progress. Um, and all this is is an extremely lightweight, semi-gooey-ish thing that just shows the sorts of information that you can get. And you see I've got two domains. I have the uh, control domain up here, and it shows the information about the control domain. And I page down, I've got an Ubuntu domain here, and you can see various information. And then we've got the ability, we're at a click here, I can add like Fedora. And here, this is actually running just on a box that's sitting at home, so hopefully the uh, the show network will hold up for another three minutes here. And that's just starting up a, a Fedora instance on a very old eBay-ish box that I, I picked up to be playing games with. And in the next 10 seconds or so, uh, we should see the instance come up. And now that's fully operational, and now we have the ability to see these things. And if we were on the right network, we could SSH into them and fiddle around with them and so forth. And I can issue like a shutdown command here with a click um, to shut down one of these uh, images. So it's just a way that, uh, that someone could start in to start to play around. And then I've got this little thing called training mode, which I actually added last night at about 1230, um, which uh, not only shows you the information, but then it begins to show you the Excel syntax as to where to find this information. So that if you want to be able to start learning how to do stuff natively in Zen, it actually shows you where it resides and, this, and basic syntax for, for pulling it out. So it's, a, it's supposed to be a way, ideally, that we can uh, you know, give you a little package you can load it on in a couple of minutes, and then actually begin to play and, uh, and see things from there. And this, this may be an obvious question. Is there some sort of interface similar to that? Well, actual, having used virtualization in the various indications of the year, one of the things I don't know where I, I, I really need, I guess I don't need it, but it's convenient. Is some sort of Okay. <laughs> yeah, the basic question is, you know, is there a, a web GUI that, that you can work with? Uh, as far as being indigenous to Zen Project, the answer is no. <clears throat> but that's part of the reason why we have so many APIs, because we try to leave that door open. And what you find, though, is that there are a number of associated projects which do have the capability. Uh, like I said, Zen Server, now open source, has a thing called Zen Center which regrettably is Windows based, but it will do that. And that when, it was, when they created it 10 years ago or whatever, um, uh, the thinking at the time was they didn't know that there would be Linux in the data center, but there were certainly Windows in the data center. And so that's available as open source now. There's also another project called Zen Orchestra, uh, and we deal with those folks quite a bit. 
uh, some good people. They work at the Zappi layer. Zen Orchestra's goal is to make a web-based API that is uh, functionally equivalent to Zen Center. And uh, that's, that's readily available, and we're hoping that uh, we can get uh, one of the Zen Orchestra principals at User Summit this year, um, uh, because it's a really interesting story. <coughs> but the bottom line is that we're trying not to force, as I said earlier, we're trying not to force people into our mold. We want to fit in yours. So we encourage these sorts of opportunities, but Zen project at its base level is command driven and API driven because when push comes to sub when, shove when you go into production, you're probably not going to use any of these things. You know, you're probably going to be either using some sort of cloud orchestration software. If you're a hosting company, you're probably going to end up with your own scripts and you know, control mechanisms and so forth. And so the, fo the focus is enabling those. But the, the top layer is a chance to be able to play with these things. The part of the reason for, for putting together, you know, this little on-ramp, which is really, really primitive and really, really ultra green, I mean, it's pre-alpha at the moment, is to try to give this sort of capability to someone who wants to do a test drive. Uh, so that you don't have to learn a whole lot to start kicking the tires and, uh, and, and then go from there. Um, knowing full well that this is going to be disposable code. Uh, that when, if you make the decision you're going into production with whatever it is you're going to production with, you're probably going to throw the GUI away and you're going to use some, some other form of scripting, orchestration, or what have you to get your job done. And that's where we really shine, is at that level giving you multiple ways to address uh, the situation. Uh, other questions? We have like a minute or so left. Anyway, I thank you very much. And uh, um, uh, if you think of other things, too, particularly about a test drive, the sort of thing that you'd like to see, uh, please contact me. I'll give you my card, whatever you want. Uh, I'd love to hear about it because this is sort of one of my balls right now, is to make it easier for people to kick the tires, make it easier for them to try this, and uh, not, to, not to break into a sweat to start using Zen and then make the decision of where they're going. So thank you very much, and thanks for staying late on a Sunday. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.